everybody, and welcome to episode six of the Unhitching Hour, how you will how, how the law works when your relationship doesn't. My name is Reed Aronson. I'm a divorce lawyer here in Manhattan. And I'm Vanessa Aronson. I'm Reed's wife. I am not a lawyer of any kind. So what we do on this show is we discuss or try to discuss how uh, the law around families and divorces and custody all work so that if you or a friend or, or a family member or you're just curious about it, uh, are going through some sort of major life event, you can maybe be a little bit more prepared and understanding of, of what's going on and what's happening in the background. Um, uh, this is our sixth episode. Uh, we're very happy to be, to be on number six, half a dozen. Uh, today on the show, uh, last week we spoke a little bit. We started, we started sort of uh, dipping our toe into the custody uh, issues of, of custody. And today we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. Um, today we're going to start, it's, it's going to be a bit of a multi-part series on the cast of characters that you will encounter if you ever find yourself in a custody dispute. Oh. Uh, and then the, the people that we're going to be talking about today, as you'll see behind us, are, are the attorneys for the children or the attorney for the child, usually if it's singular in the case. Cool. Uh, cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're one of the, the, somebody that you don't necessarily know if you haven't been through this process, but end up having a, a, a real importance, both in the life of the children that they uh, are uh, in charge of representing, uh, as well as in the case uh, that you might have. Great. So how are we going to go about talking about the attorney for the so, child? So the way that we uh, like to do this is we start off with a, a case. So we give you a fact pattern from uh, a case that really happened in New York State and was that generated a written decision. So you could go and look it up. Uh, and then Vanessa and I are gonna talk about how Vanessa thinks that case should have been decided uh, based on her intuition, on her sense of fairness and fair play, based on her sense of common sense, however she feels it should go. She'll ask me some questions, maybe about how the facts work. Maybe you'll ask me some questions about what the facts are, give you a little bit of extra detail where I can or tell you or I can't. Uh, and then Vanessa will, so we'll guess how she thinks it should come out. Then I'll tell you everybody how it did come out. We'll discuss it a little bit. Uh, today, as actually has been now the trend, although I say un unlike usual, we have multiple cases. We've got two cases today to talk okay. about. Okay. Again, both are gonna be talking about the role of the attorney for the child. And, and maybe it makes sense to say a little bit about what that means. Um, so uh, in any case, there are lawyers, right, like me. Um, but what you don't, may not know is that children, in a lot of cases, will also get a lawyer. Uh, and how their role works and how, it's, how it fits in is something that has developed over time a lot. And it's been uh, not just you know, over, over the last 20 years, it's changed a lot. Um, and again, like I said, they, they play a very important role in cases. So let's uh, get to the first tale. So clarifying question. Um, so you said, so each side, so each parent has a lawyer and then Usually. the attorney for the child is a, is a separate person? Is a separate lawyer. Interesting. Separate okay. lawyer. So a third person. So there, there'll be lawyers or if the parent represents themselves and then the, the child will often have their own attorney. Um, and we are live right now on Facebook. So if you are watching and you have a question that comes up just like I did, you can write it in the chat and we'll make sure that it gets answered. Oh, and if you miss an episode, you can always go check us out on YouTube. We are on YouTube under Unhitching Hour. Uh, we'll also be on Facebook, you know, I think on our post, if you can check out our wall. Uh, and if you ever have a question that you don't feel comfortable asking on Facebook Live, you know, you want me to answer maybe in the next episode, or if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss, over here in the corner um, yes. is uh, <laughs> Unhitching Hour is our, is our Gmail address. You can send us an email. Uh, and we will uh, hopefully uh, see your, your question on a, on a future show. Uh, but in the meantime, let's get to our first case of the day. Seth's wishes are properly represented. The 
judge appoints Sarah to be the attorney for Seth, the attorney for the child, who will represent him at the trial. So they have the trial. The mom, dad, Seth, Sarah all get to say their piece. And we're now in closing arguments. And in closing arguments, Sarah says Seth should go with his mother. Well, wait a minute, the judge thinks. That's not what Seth wants. Seth told me he wants to be with his dad. And the issue this raises is, does that mean that Sarah had been arguing contrary to what Seth wanted this entire time? And if so, what do we do now? Do we need to redo the entire trial with a new lawyer for Seth? It's not working. Oh. Technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Gotcha. <laughs> there we go. All right. Sorry but about don't that. Go back while you're actually on it. Um, okay. So we did get a note that maybe it wasn't quite loud enough, but hopefully you got a little, got some of the gist. Here's what I got. Maybe, maybe I can review the facts as I was able to understand them and see what I'm missing. So Seth, so Michael and April are getting divorced and they have a son who's 14, I think, mm -hmm. named Seth. And he shared a preference that he wanted to have, I guess, primary custody with his dad. I don't know what go with his dad means. Um, he, he wanted to spend the, the, the lion's share of his time with his with dad. With his dad, okay. And he, he was assigned an attorney for the child, so an attorney specifically representing his best interests, who shared that her conclusion was that Seth should go with his mother. And then the question, I guess, was who should does, who should he go with? No, the question is, uh, the question is, you know, so the judge sees the fact that that you know the 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 attorney for the child has made a has made an argument that seems to be counter to what the child wants, right? And says, oh wait a minute, this is a problem because does this mean that the attorney for the child has been arguing or has been trying to make a case? contrary to what this this child has wanted the whole time and is that okay can i go and i can make a decision or do we need to start over and have a whole new trial i mean i guess what i want to know is are the reasons because you know seth as a 14 year old i've you know i've been 14 before as well and i could imagine that there are preferences that seth has about how he would want his life to be that are not necessarily what's in his best interest, right? So I could see if one parent said he never had to go to school, if one parent said he could eat ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, if one parent said that at 14 years old, he could smoke and do drugs in the house and he could stay, he had no curfew. Like, of course, that 14, well, not of course, but I could imagine a situation in which, in which a 14 year old would say, hey, I wanna live with that parent. But a lawyer who is looking out for the best interest of the child saying that situation is not in the best interest for the child. So are we able to know, like I, I can see many cases in which a child preferences do not align with their best interests. Is the attorney for the child assigned to look out for the child's best interest? So that's the that's the the sort of the, the, the crux of what we're getting to. The answer to that question is is no. That's not why this lawyer was appointed. Okay. This lawyer was appointed because Seth had told the judge in in a confidential private discussion that he wanted to be with his dad. He said, I want to be with my dad. He gave reasons for why he wanted to be with his dad. And the judge said, okay, I'm going to give you a lawyer who can advocate for that position. Oh, okay. I didn't understand that. Okay. Again, I think it sort of depends on then what the reasonings 
what the reasoning was that the lawyer so decided if, alternate. Okay. So if you think that the, so in this case, by the way, the, the lawyer gave reasons why she thought he should go with the mother, um, but didn't explain why uh, she was not following Seth's instructions. Okay. Okay. Didn't say like, oh, well, you know, the problem is that, that he can't actually talk. And, you know, so I had to sort of believe it. nothing like that. Or, or he's two, right? He thought he was 14, but actually he's two years old and he can't speak. Or that she didn't explain a situation like what I said. Right. Why, why explaining why I, not only why I think he's wrong, but why I disagree with, why I, why I, why I am disregarding his. Opinion. Right. Okay. She doesn't, um, she doesn't do that. She just, so she think, gives her thing. She just said it. So then therefore, yeah, I think they probably need to start from scratch because there's a scratch? lot of information missing there. Um, meanwhile, we do have a question that came in. Do children with lawyers attend the trial? So they can, I mean, especially if they're old enough, they are technically allowed to, right? They're a citizen, um, not usually. That's, it's pretty unusual. It's, uh, I would think for a lot of reasons, it's not something that you'd wanna have happen because um, by their nature, trials are very contentious. Uh, you're gonna be having, the parents are gonna be saying nasty things about each other um, and you're not gonna want children there. And, and my guess is that in most, I, I don't think I know of a case where the children were actually in attendance, um, but I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure there's a technical prohibition on it. I assume it would be based on a judge by judge thing. So then therefore, because you said that he shared his preference with the judge, yeah. when does that happen? So so there's a, there's a process in cases where if you have a child who is of sufficient age and, and discretion, that they'll have what's called, what's called a Lincoln hearing where they will go and they will be with just the judge uh, and the judge will ask them a number of questions and they will ask them about what they want. We'll ask them about why they feel that way. They'll ask them about their relationship with each parent, those sorts of things, how they're doing, how are you doing at school? Um, and, and the judge is supposed to use this information but not necessarily, um, so it's a difficult thing, right? Because you have a, a right of, of confrontation, right? So if, let's say that the child says uh, in, in a Lincoln hearing, I don't want to be with my dad because he beats me up. Okay. Right. The, the judge is not going to tell the father necessarily here's what he said, but he has to give the, the father an opportunity to respond to the to the allegations. Okay. So it's but but if if what the if what the, what the judge is sort of trying to get more than necessarily particular pieces of information that would then have to be tested, but more of a general sense to see if does that conform with the other pieces of evidence that I have, and also to know necessarily what the what the child wants. Okay. And so that, in this case, that's how that happened, right? And that's at like the beginning here. of the process. It would, it's not at the beginning of the process. Uh, excuse me. Uh, it's not at the beginning of the process, um, but it would be before there'd be a trial. Okay. So, so there'd be some, you know, there'd be, there'd be uh, a number of things that would happen in the custody case before a judge would become that involved. Um, but uh, it would be definitely before there'd be a trial. Okay. Um, all right, so what I, what I think in this case, because I feel like I'm missing a lot of information, is that the judge needs more information to know why the attorney for the child who was hired to advocate for the child's preferences is going against them. And, and that is exactly what happens in this case. Great. Um, the judge said, it, despite, by the way, the mother said, I, I don't want to have another trial. I think we can decide it based on what you know. The father said the same thing. I think we can decide things based on what you already know. Interesting. Um, but the judge said, you know what? Uh, the, the child is supposed to have a voice. I have not been given a reason why this particular child's wishes shouldn't get advocated for in this process. There might be information that, uh, that an attorney could bring out if they were advocating for his position that I may not have heard and I, and I won't know, right? Because I don't know what I don't know. And therefore our only, the only option we have is to pick up and start over again. And th there's an interesting contrast with how this is developed. So, so a number of years ago, even, even you know, two decades ago, 15 years ago, um, rather than this sort of a role, like an attorney for the child, what you would have is sort of a third party lawyer who'd be called a guardian and writer. Mm. And that person's job 
was to basically, like you said, advocate for the what they saw as the best interest of the child. Oh, interesting. Right. So okay. they were going to do an independent investigation separate from the parents. They were going to look into it and they were going to say, look, I've, I've seen all of these things and, and, and make a recommendation. Judge, here's what I think ought to happen. Right. But about 15 years ago, there was a, the, the view became that, wait a minute, it's kind of confusing what this person's job is. Right, because isn't it the judge's job? Isn't it the judge's job to decide what's in the best interest of the, of the child? Why do we need another person saying that? Also, you know, there was a confusion. Well, well, if they're if they're taking one parent's side or not, can we then trust what they're saying? Okay. Um, so there was there was all sorts of issues like that, and and ultimately what they decided was, you know, also and, and how much do we take into account what the child wants? How much should this guardian do that? And it became confusing to people. So the, the decision was made really to move in a different direction from the guardian at litem model to this attorney for the child model. And in that way, give the, give the children, it was thought, more of a direct voice in what happened. I see. Because the view was is that's important. And, and it's not, and like you said, it's not the only question. It's not even, maybe not even the, the most important factor, right? Um, you know, there, there might be all sorts of things that children want that aren't in their best interests, but they should still be able, just like, look, I, if I'm, if I have a, if I'm a party to a lawsuit, right, if uh, I can, I can ask my lawyer to, to, to advocate for positions that the lawyer might think, you know what, Reed, that's, that's really not the smartest thing in the world. You're much better off doing, you know, you want to do A, but you're much better off doing B, but you know what, you want A, so that's what we'll do, Okay. right? Like, I get to have that. I have that right. So why shouldn't children, right? Okay. Why should children have to be, well, be told, well, you don't know what's best for you um, by, a, by their own lawyer. So that's the notion. So the notion is that if, you know, two spouses, let's just for simplicity's sake, say a, a mother and a father, um, each have their own lawyer advocating for their preferences. The child has a lawyer advocating for the child's preferences. And the judge is supposed to, in a custody case, as we learned last week, is supposed to make a decision based on the best interest of the child. Is there ever a situation where a case would have both a guardian ad litem and an attorney for the child? I, I am I'm not aware of any. I can't say it never happened. Um, I do have a case right now, oddly, um, uh, that I won't go into detail and for obvious reasons, but it's been going on for some time. At one point, we had an attorney for the child, and and now we have a guardian title. Okay, that's so was, that was going to be my next question: is how do you do, is it something you can opt into either one or the other, or how do you decide Ge which model? Gener you generally, judges are going to make you are going to appoint um, judges are going to decide which one they want, and whether or not it's a guardian. Correct. It's up to the, it's up okay. to the judge, and usually the judge is going to, nowadays in New York. The attorney for the child is much more prevalent than the guardian of life. There are very few cases with guardians anymore. Um, and it's up to the judge. And, and frankly, sometimes judges use it as, um, you know, both to help them understand the case a little bit better, because it's sometimes hard when you have just, you know, squabbling parents, um, but also as a way of saying, of, of sort of showing to parents, like, hey, this is a serious process. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an important process. And, and you guys really need to figure yourselves out so that we're not in a situation where you're, you know, you really want to figure this out because this is not something that, that's fun, right? Yeah. Um, it's almost it's almost held over them like like a like a bad consequence of not being able to come to an agreement. Okay. And one one more question, but I guess before we move on to I think the second the second case, is there an age at which a child is now able to have an attorney for the child, or can a newborn baby have an attorney for the child a newborn baby a newborn baby can have an attorney for the child uh, and in fact often will and then how how does an let's, attorney for the child oh let's, okay let's go to our maybe that's that's a good time to go to our next case okay <laughs> all right so i think that what happened the last time is i failed to share computer sound that was my bad um but we're going to wait a minute hold on no where is you it? may have gotten out of it i oh, may have gotten out of it task manager, so yeah hold on know. sorry so while we're doing this, uh, we will. Oh, here we go. Okay. So we just get to. Uh... Yeah. Gilda's saying hello. I don't know if anyone can hear, but she's just 
Megan Safari's in the background. All righty, so here we go. I don't think you shared this. No, I didn't. I know. I know. Yeah. Share screen. Optimize video. Here we go. Today's second case is called Viscuso v. Viscuso from Buffalo, New York, in 2015. Betty is parents are getting divorced, and her lawyer named Lee has been appointed to represent her. Betty tells Lee that she wants to be with her mother. That's what she wants. But that's not what Lee argues at trial. At trial, Lee argues that Betty, in fact, should be with her father. In Lee's mind, Betty's mother has so alienated her from her dad that Betty's judgment can't be trusted, and she should substitute her own judgment instead. But wait a minute, Betty's mom says. Lee is Betty's lawyer. She's supposed to do what Betty tells her. If she won't, Betty should be appointed a new lawyer who will. So the question is, who was right? Was Lee right to substitute her own judgment for that of Betty? Or was Betty's mom right? Should Lee be replaced as the AFC for violating her client's wishes? Okay, so... Those are the facts of this case. Um, the, the, the real main difference here, um, first of all, before you ask, we don't know how whole Betty is. We don't know. We do not know. It's, it is not stated anywhere in the opinion. Um, and I, I don't have any personal knowledge of how old she was. Um, we can assume she's old enough to express her wishes, right? She's not, right. Uh, she's she's not, not a new, newborn. She's not a newborn um, and, and there's nothing in the opinion or anything to indicate that she had any particular um, you know, intellectual deficits, anything like that, any, any difficult, any difficulty expressing her, her views or anything like that. Um, okay. It comes down to Lee saying, I think that she has been effectively manipulated by her mother to the point where, uh, you know, I don't, I can't trust her judgment. So I'm, I'm going to say what I think. Okay. So again, this is how, what I understood. Betty is the is the child we don't know how old she is she she her parents are getting divorced she expresses a preference she wants to stay with her mom and the attorney for the child advocates a different position saying that betty has been so alienated from her father that she can't even have an opinion on whether or not she would like to be with the father okay um, I mean, is this ever like just thinking about kind of what you, you spoke of before about sort of a lawyer's role to take into account not only the person's preferences, but also to make sure that they understand what's in their best interest, right? So someone can hire a lawyer and they can say, I want X, Y, Z. And the lawyer probably has a responsibility to say, hey, that might be what you want, but it's not really gonna be turn out great for you. I feel like, I'm, I guess I'm curious if there are situations in which a client, let's not make it a child, but a client wants something that is against their self-interest and a lawyer has a reason to believe that they're being manipulated into that. Like what, as a lawyer, do you, is that something you cover in law school or ethics about <laughs> like what your, what your role is? If, if you really were to see that some, someone. Well, look, you know, if you're talking about an adult, um, you know, it, it has to be really, really extreme, right? You know, I was manipulated, right? Manipulate lots of things are manipulated. Yeah. Right. When we talked about prenups, right? Like a lot of what happens yeah, in prenups, yeah. one could describe as manipulation, right? You know, oh, he, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what was going on. I really wanted to get married. I was really focused on this sort of thing. But we say, look, you're an adult. You're responsible for, um, you know, to, to, a, to a certain limit fighting against that kind of manipulation, right? Right. No, look, if somebody threatens your life, if somebody, you know, really blackmails you, yeah, that's different. But short of that, we expect you to sort of, you know, make your own decision. Do you feel the same way about if you're talking about a child? Yeah, okay. 
I, I think I've come up with what I think my answer should be. Um, I think my answer is that the judge should, I don't even know what the word is, consult two additional attorneys for the child and the majority win. The majority win. So, you know, like just to double check, right? But I would, I would do two more because if you do one more and then they say the other way, right? Then you're like, uh-oh, how do we decide? So I would say that the judge would say, in this, in order to double check okay. that that the attorney for the child is not, you know, missing something or seeing something or having their own preferences, I order that two more attorneys for the child think about the case and make a ruling, and whichever one. Okay. Well, that well one. what if one of them says, yeah, that she should be with the mother? And then the third one says both of these parents are awful. Send the kid to foster care. <laughs> then what do we do? Do we get three yeah, more? No. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Majority. I guess wins. you need four more, right? <laughs> Majority wins. So that's what I think, right? Because there's got to be. I mean, in this case, like there's got to be maybe a little bit of double checking, and and I to start over from scratch, and maybe maybe I think this for the last case too, but to start over from scratch means you could still also get another attorney for the child who's biased in a different way. So what, I guess, what, what are the questions that you're asking that these new, so you're getting two new people. What are the, what's the question you're asking them to answer? Is, is does Betty have the capacity to make a decision or to have a preference? To have a preference, and, and because Sarah, or sorry, Lee. I'm getting Lee. Lee in this one. Lee was making the case that she doesn't even, she can't possibly have a preference because she's been so alienated from her father. And so the question to the other two is, what do you think? Do you think she has enough information here to to exhibit a preference? Why, why can't the judge just say, okay, Lee, what are your reasons? And and make a decision as to whether she, whether the judge agrees with Lee's reasons. Why do, why do we need like, more opinions is it, uh, well because why well because you didn't give us what these reasons were other than Lee's, no Lee's reason. reason was what Lee what Lee said was I believe that she has been manipulated by her mother into into well, being into just like okay, her mother. so so I guess I guess like the other case it's like what's the evidence to prove that she's been alienated so much from her father that she had but like if the judge can't take that evidence and make a de decision, then I think you need other, other um, I, I think, uh, so, so let me, let me stipulate using the legal word in this case, that there was good reason to believe in this case that the mother had engaged in alienation. Okay. So that the mother had said nasty things about the father. The mother had told the daughter, you, you don't want to go right, sweetie. The, the mother had intentionally missed visitations. The, the mother had been late or, or, you know, very late for either picking the kid up for, for, for dropping the kid off or early to try and pick the kid up. Um, the, 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 I think in this case, I, I'm, I'm not certain. So if I'm wrong, I apologize. But I think at one point the mother, in fact, took the kid and didn't tell the father where the kid was. Um, so there was good reason to believe that that was something that had happened in this case. Okay. And, and then I guess here, here's one more thing. At, and maybe this has been in the back of my mind for both of these cases. I, being your wife and sort of like hearing about divorce law, thought that there wasn't really a, I'm going with mom, I'm going with dad anymore. I thought things were relatively even Stevens now. So does it, like, does it really matter? So a, a question came in, or I don't know if it's a question or a comment, maybe it doesn't really matter what Betty wants so long as she's not being harmed by one or the other parent. And I guess I'm sort of also saying in both of these cases, does it really matter? Like, why are we, how, are, are these cases about primary custody or so, are they about? So in this case, yes, it was about primary custody. It's also about decision-making a lot at the time. Okay. Um, in the sense of big major decisions, right? That's, that's often gonna go somewhat part and parcel with who has the child the most often. Um, and, but yes, it's, it's about, it's about who, time. It's about who has more time, who has the most time, uh, that then, and we don't need to get into this too much, but that also then bleeds into child support. 
because if you don't have the child under New York law, and this is something that's just new, you know, that's that's New York specific. It's it's not the same in every other state. Um, but in New York, if you don't have at least fifty percent of the time, you are not entitled to receive child uh, child support. So that's a that's a big deal, um, and goes into this fight a lot. Um, and in this case, Betty's position was that she really didn't want to see her father at all. That was really her view. She really didn't want to see her father at all. I thought, again, just from like other episodes or being your wife and hearing, I thought that like at least New York State sort of had a blanket feeling that children should be with their parents. Correct. And that children should be with, if both parents are fine parents, children should be with both parents just that, about as equally as possible, right? Sure, sure. But in this case, right, there was there was a parent, right? It, it, sometimes that's a conflict and it's difficult because in this case, you had one parent who was saying, who believed that who, the mother who believed that the father was not somebody who should have any time or, okay. or really any significant time at all because for whatever reason, she believed that, right? It wasn't just, well, I don't like you. It was, it was... I think you're violent. I think you're mean. I think you're a bad parent. I think you're unfit. And then obviously on his end, he thought that the mother, the more time that she had with the kid, was basically more of an opportunity to alienate the daughter. Okay. Right. So there's there's yes, in an ideal world, you want as much of a relationship with both parents as you can get, but you're not when you're when you're in a fight like this, you're not in an ideal world anymore. And at some level, um, you know, you're gonna have to make a determination. Now, maybe ultimately the determination is both of you are wrong, both of you are fine, and your only problem is with each other. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna ignore your interpersonal conflict and I'm gonna do what's best for the kid. Okay. So here's a question. How often do parents try to alienate children? And are what are the consequences for that? So uh, I, it depends. Alien look, alienation is a is a excuse me, a wide spectrum of things. If you're asking me how often do uh, parents make the occasional nasty or cutting remark about their ex-spouse in front of their children, uh, it happens a lot. Um, if you're talking about, you know, to the point of, of you know, of, of, of withholding access, that happens less often. Um, but, you know, in terms of that kind of just sort of, you know, the, the low level stuff, happens, again, it's, it's a spectrum. It depends on the severity of it, but it but at least at a low level, it happens quite often. In in terms of, so like last week, we learned that one of the, um, one of the qualifications or characteristics that you're looking at when, when a judge is thinking about who should get more time or less time or be able to move across the country or not move across the country was like the parent's willingness to develop a relationship with the other, with the, with mm -hmm. the child and the other parent. So like this question was, what are the consequences for alienation? So I'm assuming if this were to come up during a trial. Absolutely. That that look, would be. And it look, it, it depends on, it, it depends on the particulars. Like I said, it's not like there is a, there is a, oh, well, you, you, you called your uh, ex-husband a dumb idiot in front of the kid. So now you lose three days. Like it's, it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one sort of thing like that. But, but overall, right, the picture that you're giving, and if you give a picture as a parent of being somebody who is going to be, be detrimental to the relationship between your child and the other parent, and by the way, I'm talking about without cause. I, I understand, you know, I'm not talking here about, um, you know, extremes, right? Like uh, there, there was physical violence and, and you took the kid away from physical violence, right? That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about failing to do the things or doing things that are that are negative towards that relationship when you ought not be doing that. That's going to have a negative impact on, on the judge's view of how are you going to foster it, and it's going to hurt you, whether it hurts you in time, whether it hurts you in decision making. It, it will it will be detrimental to your position. Um, there's no again there's no there's no magic formula that I could write on a on a blackboard and say like you know three three nasty statements equals you know four hours of visitation. But but that's the that's the the general notion and and all else being equal certainly the the more hospitable you seem and the more um, if not friendly but the more courteous you are about the other parent the better off you're going to be. Okay, and then this is a little bit of a dark question here. How bad does one parent need to be 
in, in, to not get custody or significant time. So understanding that the goal, the ideal is sort of eat, that children get relationship with an equal relationship with both parents. How bad does it have to be to, to get? Nowadays, uh, it has to be real bad. Um, you know, he's not the best parent in the world. You know, there used to be a notion, and I think there still is, at least in sort of the popular imagination, right? Well, the mom gets the kids almost all the time, and the dad gets, uh, you know, maybe three days, two days on the weekends, every other weekend, and maybe a dinner in the middle of the week. And that is just not the case anymore. Um, nowadays, it's, it's much more even as, a, as almost a default. So if you're, if you're going to be a parent who gets like, you get one day, one dinner a week or something like that, only, only very parents who have a lot of challenges in their parenting will get, will get that sort of schedule. Now, look, sometimes people come to agreements, um, you know, and, and for whatever reason, maybe there's a, one of, one of them travels a lot for work and they come to an arrangement and they say, look, you know, I, I can't handle five days out of every two weeks or six days out of every two weeks. Let's do something different. Let's manage a different schedule. That doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad parent. And I, I don't want to imply that. But I mean, in terms of if, if you're really fighting about it, if you're really having a at loggerheads, um, that notion that like, okay, well, I'll get the kids almost all the time and you'll get, you know, two or three days every three weeks, every two weeks, it's, it's just not the case anymore. And, and sort of that fear of like, oh, he'll take the kids or, oh, she'll take the kids. In, at least in New York State, is that pretty rare unless it's a really, really egregious circumstance? It's, it's, in, it's, it's in New York State. It, it's as far as I, it's the same situation as far as I'm aware in New Jersey. Um, it's, I, you know, every state that I am aware of and I have spoken to people about this, the, 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 the general notion of like, you know, the weekend, every other weekend father, which again, it was very gendered. I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, trying to perpetuate those notions, but that's the way it lies. Um, it's just not the way it is anymore. And oh, and I'll take the kids and you'll never see them. By the way, that's the kind of threat that if a judge finds out about it, is not gonna look very good for you in your, in your case. Well, and I think that it could all, whether or not it's an explicit threat, I think it could also just be a concern uh, for someone oh, who's, absolutely. who's thinking about getting divorced to say, I, I don't want the other, you know, we watch movies and, and it's almost always like that, right? I don't want to get divorced because she's going to take the kid. And you're saying that that's like pretty rare for look, that to happen. And, and I mean, look, you know, another thing I think is important to know, I'm talking about the legality of it and what a judge is going to do and what a judge is going to think and, and what the law says. I understand the, the practical reality of people's lives is not, is not always so simple, right? That it's easy for me as a lawyer to sit there and say, oh, well, you know, a judge will give you five days out of 14 out of every two weeks or six days out of every two weeks. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not gonna be a fear that, well, in practicality, you know, my, my kid, if my kid is with her the rest of the time, she's gonna be saying nasty things about me. I'm, my, it's gonna impact my visitation. I, you know, there, there are real things that, that factor into this that are not necessarily on the page of a written decision. Um, and I don't want to minimize those things. But when you're talking about the law, the law very much is about, believes now very strongly that, that time, significant time, meaningful time with both parents is, is almost in, on default the best in the best decisions of every child. Okay. And then it looks like we've got another question coming in. And this, we don't have another case, right? It's just no, no, there's just okay. So we'll, um, if there's any other questions that are coming in, can type them in now because this looks like this might be our last question. What happens when the judge makes a decision about time, but the kid doesn't want to follow that? Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit of last week. Um, the answer is that depending on the age of the kid, it, you know, sometimes the answer is not much. Um, you know, kid, uh, you know, there was one, I remember a news story, and this was a number of years back. Where, where a judge threw kids in jail because they didn't want to have visitation with, with one of the parents. I, 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 have never, I have never experienced personally a case like that. I've never experienced a judge threaten anything like that or even come close to it. Um, you know, a judge is not going to punish children. Um, and at some level, you know, uh, you're not going to handcuff a kid 
and throw him in the back of the taxi. <clears throat> but um, what a judge can do if it gets sufficiently bad is a judge can say, look, you're, you have decided, young, young person, young man, young woman, um, that you are not interested in having a relationship with your father or your mother anymore. Therefore, I am going to say that you're emancipated from that parent. Oh, wow. And therefore, that parent is not going to have any obligation to support you. Okay. Um, now that's drastic. It doesn't. It's not something that you know. It's not the. It's not the first, you know, club out of the bag. Certainly, but it is. That's an option. And and look, you know, there's also, you know, on a practical sense, one of the things that's coming up now in our practice a lot. Is, uh, there are therapists who specialize in this. And one of the things that the therapists who specialize in this will tell you is that the sooner you catch something like this, the sooner you, you deal with an issue like this, the better off you are. And it requires, it's difficult. It's a very difficult psychological thing to try and convince a child to do something that they may not want to do. And look, the other time, sometimes, you know, kids are kids and sometimes they're fickle. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so you don't necessarily want to overreact just because maybe on one day the kid wasn't feeling like it. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation and you have to take every situation differently. So, it, so what I'm hearing is if you're in a situation where there's a custody agreement in place and the child, presumably older child, um, is starting to show some resistance to the agreement that, that there's therapists in place that can help work through whatever try to try to work through and, whatever and, those issues are. And the, and the earlier you try and address stuff like that, the better, because once it becomes bad enough, obviously, it, it, you know, it's, it's easier when it's not, when the resistance is not quite as set in, when it hasn't become as much of a bad conflict between the parent who's not getting the time and the child. Okay. All right. Interesting. And so, so I think we, we haven't actually told you how the case went out, how, oh, yeah. how, uh, how the last case went. In I the, just assumed I was right. <laughs> so in the last case, we... Uh, the judge, the judges, and this was an appeal, said that Lee was correct in substituting her judgment. Wow. And, and what the, the standard is, is that attorneys for the children, sort of getting back to our, to our main topic, attorneys for the children are supposed to follow the wishes of their clients unless one of two things happens. One, the child doesn't have sufficient intelligence, discretion, communicative verbal abilities to actually express what it is that they want. This is a newborn, right? Like obviously, or, or even like a two-year-old, right? A, that a two-year-old may say, I love my mommy. I want to be with my mommy, mommy, mommy. You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. Okay, sweetie. But like, that's not, that's not a, that's not a thoughtful judgment. And the other is if in the, if in the honest belief of the lawyer, the views of the child are so detrimental and so against their best interests that they put them in, in physical or emotional danger, mm. right? That their safety is, is in danger. So, so that's the best interest piece, but well, I guess it's like, it's not best interest, it's, right. it's the opposite. It's, it's, you know, best interest, you mostly think about it kind of like this, right? Right. Oh, well, you know, uh, he's, he, he has a much better, a much more flexible work schedule. That's good. But on the other hand, he's maybe a little bit too strict of a disciplinarian, you know, this kind of thing. For the, the notion is that for, for a, an attorney for the child to substitute their judgment over that, it has to be like this. Right. It has okay. to be what they're saying is so, is so is genuinely dangerous. And I can't in good conscience go to a judge and say, this is what should happen. Right. And in, the, in this case, in the last case that we talked about, um, it was, it was sort of a combination of the two. That on the one hand, the, ju the judge decided, look, um, I agree that, that in this case, the, the, the daughter has been so manipulated, Betty has been so manipulated by her mother that really, I'm, I don't think we can trust what, what she says. Okay. It's, it's almost like she's, a, she's an infant, right? That, that you know, she's, she's become so suggestible. And on the other hand, they said, look, and also what she wants will basically end her relationship with her father. And we view that as fundamentally detrimental to her in a way that, that, that justified Lee substituting her, her, her judgment for that of Betty. So, so again, so attorneys for the children are really supposed to advocate for what their children want, even if they don't agree with that, unless they hit one of these two things. Um, oh. And that's, that's where we are. So that's attorneys for the children. Very interesting. I, I did not know that. And now you know that. 
Uh, so since I don't think we have any more questions today, that has been episode six of the Unhitching Hour. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, again, you can reach us by email at unhitchinghour at gmail.com. Sorry, un unhitchinghour at gmail.com. Uh, on our YouTube page, which is Unhitching Hour, uh, I try and put the episodes up every week. Uh, so you can go check out any episodes you've missed. Um, I am Reed Aronson. I'm a divorce lawyer here in Manhattan. Uh, I'm uh, going to give you a disclaimer that this is not legal advice. Um, this is for educational and entertainment purposes, you know, for, for background information of a discussion of what the law is. But uh, if you need legal advice, I, I urge you, please go speak to a, to a lawyer who is licensed in your jurisdiction, whatever jurisdiction that may happen to be. Uh, and uh, again, I'm Reed Aronson. I'm a divorce lawyer here in Manhattan. I'm Vanessa Aronson. I'm his wife. And this has been the Unhitching Hour, how the law works when your relationship doesn't. Thanks, everybody. See you next week.